Well, let's open our Bibles together to Matthew chapter 2. And we'll just remind ourselves of uh, the birth of Christ. It's a very basic study, but obviously worth our time. And we'll look at verses 1 through 12. As already mentioned, if you're able, we'll be celebrating tomorrow, Christmas Day here. And it begins at 9 o'clock. And we will be having our Wednesday night study. And people are saying, well, that's like four days in a row. <laughs> yeah, you, you get in the Word every day. <laughs> Duh. So I'll be here anyway, and I've already been saying Marie has to be here, so that's two of us. And Jared's our worship leader. I pay him. So that'll be three. But uh, I look forward to seeing you this upcoming uh, Wednesday night. But let's begin reading here. Matthew chapter 2, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 12. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men came from the east, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who was, has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered the chief priests, all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel." Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. When they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced in with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. I'll read verse 12 just to conclude it. Then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. And so obviously, Christmas traditionally is a time of celebration it's a time of wonderful fellowship for many, time to make great memories, and the Christmas season can be a very beautiful time of the year, and that's because the birth of a Savior is intended to bring great joy to us. It's joyful because God has openly revealed how deeply He loves us, and He revealed to us the depth of His love by sending Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ tells us that He came to seek and to save those who are lost, and so when the lost are found, they might be so surprised by it that they might have a tremendous amount of joy. Because, you see, salvation is intended to bring joy. We remember in Luke's gospel how that when the angel announced Jesus' birth, and in the announcement he had said, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. He went on to say, because unto you this day in the city of David is born a Savior. And Jesus Christ, who's going to be saving us, should bring us great joy. And so when someone comes to Christ, the joy that they have of sins forgiven and a new life with God can be incredible. It's like what it says in Psalm 32, verse 2, Blessed or happy is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him. So the Christmas season is above all things a time to receive forgiveness and joy. Christmas is the remembering that God invaded human history in order that He might provide salvation. Christmas is the celebration of what is called the Incarnation, Emmanuel, God is with us. The prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, said this, Isaiah wrote, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Well, in that prophecy, Isaiah gives us insight into the Lord Jesus Christ. One of my friends and I were having a conversation the other day, and he was sharing some things with me. I said, I'm going to steal that. That's so good. 
and I'm going to share it with my church. I'm not going to give you credit, but I will mention I stole it. But I liked it. I liked how he, he put something here. Because he said, in the prophecy of Isaiah, notice with me, I read to you in Isaiah 9, verse 6, it says, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And so, in that prophecy, we see a, a, uh, a child that was placed in a manger. So in that prophecy, we see the crib. It reveals that the Messiah will be born, and upon birth, he will be placed in a feeding trough. The child would be born and would be placed in a manger. So you see a crib, but you also see a cross, because he says, a child is born, unto us a son is given. And when you study the book of Isaiah, you will see that when it speaks concerning him being given, that speaks of his sacrifice. It's a prophecy of Jesus being offered, given on our behalf. Remember John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his son. So when, when Isaiah was prophesying, he saw a picture of the crib, but he also saw a picture of a cross. And so during this season, we celebrate the giving of the gift of God's own son, God's Son was given for us that we might have eternal life, and He has become our King because He also is the King. And so by God giving us Jesus, He demonstrates to us what love is because we prophetically see a crown. The government will be on His shoulder. He's born to rule. He is Messiah. And so when we look at Matthew, that's what we're going to look at tonight and just touch on a few things. So notice again in verse 1, in chapter 2, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. And now, John said that they were kings. He's, he's wrong. Um, and I'm going to fire him for that. No, I'm teasing you. Maybe you believe me. I shouldn't say that. No, I'll say it anyway. They were not kings. We got the we three kings from a hymn. What they are is they are wise men. The word wise men is a word that is actually from the, the word magi. The word magi is a word for magician. And what you have here is the Chaldeans. These are priests. They were from the east. And these men from the east were representing a religious system, a system that more than likely, even undoubtedly, had been influenced by a very important Jewish prophet by the name of Daniel. Daniel had been in Babylon in captivity. And if you read the book of da Daniel, you'll see that Daniel was actually made the head or the chief of the Magi. And so as the chief of the Magi, there's no doubt that he would have influenced those people who he had uh, authority over. And more than likely, as he was sharing with them, he would have shared with them things concerning what the Bible says related to the Messiah. You see, Daniel had had uh, more than likely made them acquainted with a prophecy that was made by a man by the name of Balaam who was from that area. Balaam was a false prophet, but he gave a true prophecy concerning Messiah. You see that in Numbers 24, verse 17, where Balaam said, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. So these magi may have been waiting for a sign of the coming ruler. As students of astronomy, that the sign of a star would be significant. And in conjunction with an unusual star in the heavens, they made their journey to Israel. Now this star, the star was a light that they followed as they traveled south, and it stood over a house, the Scripture says. So this leads some Bible expositors to say that this light was actually the Shekinah glory of God. This glory was seen in ancient Israel. It was the pillar of fire that, that led, excuse me, the Jews. Somebody said, because the Shekinah glory was a light that could move and could point to the presence of God, it is possible that the star mentioned in Matthew 2 was not an astronomical object, but actually the appearance, after a few hundred years' absence, of the Shekinah glory of God. So their journey covered a period of time, and they arrived to Jerusalem. And they come with a question. Notice verse 2. Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? We've seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. So they come to a palace expecting to find a king. 
Now, the sign was for the wise men alone. Obviously, it wasn't for everybody. But they had come with the intent, and I want you to notice this, to worship. They had a pagan background, but they responded to the light that they had, and they came. Luke chapter 2, verse 32 says that Jesus is a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And so they say, we have come to worship him. They're going to receive instruction in a moment, and they're going to follow that instruction. But as this takes place, verse 3, Herod the king heard this, and he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who, is, who will shepherd my people Israel. And so what happens here is he begins to inquire. And so in verse 7, Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared, and he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child, and when you found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. And so the response of the wise men was worship. But the response of Herod, hostility. Because he's concerned that he's going to lose his kingdom. He's troubled. And all Jerusalem was troubled with him. When you read history, you discover that Herod was power hungry. In his reign, he murdered the high priest. He killed his own wife. He killed her mother. And he killed two of his own sons in order that he might retain power. And the lust for power is a great corrupter of the soul. The lust for power had complete control of his life. And that lust for power was rooted in stubborn pride. Jesus spoke of it in Luke 19, verses 12 through 14, when he said, A certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him, saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. So on one hand, you have people who come to worship. But on the other hand, you have someone who is openly hostile. You see, Christ is to be crowned king over our lives. But some respond to his claim over us with hostility as well as rejection. And to this very day, there's still a clear hostility towards Jesus and the message of the cross. In spite of the rejection, Jesus is still king. And that's something that every person will one day recognize. And then you have in verse 4, the scribes and the chief priests. It says, when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And here's a third response you have. The first one was worship. The second one is hostility. But the third one, I think, is probably the most severe. The third one is indifference. There are people who are openly hostile towards the gospel message. You know that. You've shared the gospel with people. Not everybody likes hearing about Jesus. Not everybody wants to hear about him. They're openly hostile. But the ones that concern me the most are the indifferent ones, the ones who kind of blow you off and don't really care. And what's terrible about this, on top of their indifference, is they knew the Scripture. When the question was asked, where will Messiah be born, they were able to say, Oh, the Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem because the prophet has made it very clear. That's where he'll be born. And so what you have here is indifference. You have these people who know Scripture but don't respond to it. And they're the most dangerous of all because their rejection of Jesus influences. It influences eternity. It influences the eternity of all who sit under their teaching. So when you have somebody who is presenting things about God and not showing the right reverence, and not, and not dividing the passage correctly. There are people today who think that's no big deal. But the fact is, it is a big deal. Because when somebody is opening the Word and teaching the Word, 
That is an eternal influence. And if you have somebody who knows Scripture but undermines it with unbelief, they are a dangerous teacher or adds to it things that are not found in Scripture. They're a dangerous teacher. So these people with their indifference were actually very dangerous. Now we have the wise men and they, they wanted to worship. But you have Herod, a power-hungry man who has hostility. But you have the scribes, you have the religious leaders, and these are the dangerous ones because they're indifferent. Their rejection of Jesus influences people for eternity. There are many people today, and it's a different time than I know when I first got saved, but there are many people today who don't believe that uh, there's such a place as hell. They will say there is a place called heaven. They say, of course, there's a place called heaven. Something's got to be better than this. But the idea of a place called hell isn't something they would entertain. They're very indifferent to that. But you know, when I first got saved, I was taught that the Word of God is true. I was taught that from the beginning. As a matter of fact, before I got saved, I believed that the Bible was God's Word. I, I didn't put my trust in it, but I believed it. I believed when someone would quote a scripture to me, that they would be saying something that God had preserved for me. I believe that because I've been raised in a religious background. And so when I was told about heaven, I thought there must be hell I didn't want to think about. But I did know that the Bible says that there's such a place as heaven and such a place as hell. And that's what motivated me at the age of 20 to talk to my mom and my dad. That's why I did. That's why I sat there at the table with them. And that's why I told my dad what I said when I told him, Dad, you're a good man. You're the best man I'll ever know. But you will be the best man in hell if you don't give your heart to Jesus Christ. That's why I told him that. I've had people ask me, how could you at the age of 20 talk to your father? Isn't that disrespectful? No, I didn't believe it was at all. I thought it was the most loving thing I could do. I thought it was the most important, loving thing I could do as a son for a father. Because I loved my dad. And I believed in heaven. And I believed in hell. And I would not have been loving my father if I would not have warned him about judgment to come. You'll find it interesting when you read your Bible. Jesus spoke more about judgment to come than he did about heaven. Why? Because when you trust him, you go to heaven. So he warns you continuously against going to hell. And that's what makes these people so terrible. It's because they know what the Scripture says. They're able to say, oh, it's going to be in Bethlehem because we know in the Scriptures where it says it but they were completely indifferent to it. It's a very dangerous place to be. Later on in Matthew, in chapter 23, verse 13, Jesus said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. You're hindering them from entering in. And so you have these responses. In verse 9, it says, when they heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over the house or stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Their quest is complete. They're able to come and worship the king. They're not in a stable. Notice they're living in a house. The small city must have been filled with excitement as they arrived. Here come the magi. They enter into the house. Immediately they fell down before Jesus and they worshiped him. They touched the ground with their forehead is the picture of worship. And they were saying, this indeed is the one I worship. This is interesting. I did a Facebook Live thing, and I get real interesting responses sometimes from people who will view it. And, and one individual wrote in, a, uh, in response because I talked about worshiping Christ. And uh, somebody wrote in response to what I had shared. He said, uh, I don't worship Christ. I only worship God. And, and I, I shared with them that you cannot worship God if you don't worship Jesus. You're to honor Jesus even as you honor the Father. 
In John 5, 23, Jesus said, All should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. So you can't worship God unless you worship him through the Son. That's why the incarnation is so important. There's so many people who say, oh, I have a relationship with God. But Jesus taught otherwise. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. So there's no entrance into the presence of God if it isn't through the Son. So why is Christmas important? Because God took upon himself human flesh, dwelt amongst us, and from the very beginning, Jesus Christ is worshipped. And as he was worshipped by these who came to worship him, they presented gifts to him. They made their offerings. And I want you to notice something else here. In verse 11, it says, When they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him. So the gifts went to Jesus. All true worship is an expression of the heart, and it is directed towards Jesus Christ. And notice they gave gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold is a gift for a king. Frankincense, a gift for a priest. And myrrh is used for burials. It was a gift for a savior. And the gifts that they gave him enabled him to make an escape to Egypt that he might survive. Now, someone once said, if our greatest need had been information, God would have sent us an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us an economist. If our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. But our greatest need was forgiveness. So God sent us the Savior. And so we worship Him. These men that we refer to as wise men are the first people in the New Testament who are actually said to worship Jesus. And as it's been said so many times, and I'll say it as I close, wise men still worship Him.